Our second scripture reading comes from Luke 1, 26 to 38. Hear these words. Again, Luke 1, beginning verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is God's holy word for us this evening. Now, we live in the time of fulfillment. We live on this side of Christ's coming, this side of history. He has already come. He has already established his kingdom. He already rules and reigns. And so sometimes when we read, especially early in the Gospels, of these announcements of the one who's going to be born, it might not hit us quite the same way that it would have for those who were anticipating it. We won't necessarily feel the same kind of an anticipation or the same kind of excitement or the same kind of fear because we're, we're this side of everything. But those who first heard these things would have been filled with all of that and more. And maybe for some of you tonight, uh, the reality of Emmanuel, right, which means God with us, this child who is born, maybe that's not quite come to you. Or maybe you haven't had ears to hear it, eyes to see it. Either way, all of us in this room get to hear it again tonight. Right? We get to hear this announcement once more. Now, we'll be reading the announcement on the night of Christ's birth to the shepherds a little bit later. And here, this is a bit more of an Advent text leading up to the night of Christ's birth beforehand. But uh, I want to look at this because when the angel comes, when the angel Gabriel comes and speaks to Mary, he, he announces to her what kind of child this would be that is going to be born to her. He tells us what this child would be like. Even before Christ was born, it was declared who he was, what he would do. So what does it say about him? Right? What would he be? What would he do? Well, the first thing I think we should notice is that he was announced by angels. An angel has already come to Zechariah and announced that John the Baptist will be born to Elizabeth, and now here, once again. And so angels play such a massive role in this story. They'll appear other times as well. They'll keep playing a role in Christ's birth. But here for us, most importantly, the angel Gabriel shows up to Mary and tells her of this child that's going to be conceived in her womb, though she is a virgin. And I want you to think for a moment about all of the places in the Old Testament, right, leading up to this point, all of the places you can think of angels showing up to people, angels announcing something. Kids, I want all the kids to think about that too. Think about all the stories of angels in the Old Testament that you know about. When we think about it, there's really not that many. 
I mean, there's, there's a, a handful of them. There are some. Uh, but when you think about the size of the Old Testament, the am amount of times that angels show up to people, it's really not that often. There are angels that are associated with judgment, right? Think here of maybe the angel that w was sent to guard the entrance to the Garden of Eden, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the taking of the life of the firstborn in Egypt, or the judgment after David takes a census. There are angels that will attend to various prophets. Think of the life of Elijah, or maybe most what might come to mind is in the story of Daniel, as, for instance, Gabriel shows up and brings a message to him, as angels close the mouths of the hungry lions when he's thrown into the pit. We're told that there were angels uh, attending the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. The angel of the Lord leads the people in the wilderness. The commander of the Lord's armies, this angelic figure, shows up to Joshua before the battle of Jericho. So there are times they show up to the, the leaders of Israel, to the prophets. Most of the time, angels show up in these kind of heavenly visions, right? It, heaven, as it is, is revealed to them. They're, they're allowed to see it. Whether that be seen the throne room of God, as Isaiah sees or, or Ezekiel sees, whether it be Gehazi having his eyes opened by Elijah to see the heavenly host all around him. We've just gone through the vast majority of the stories that angels appear in in the Old Testament. There's, it's really not that often. There's some that we've missed. There's some that I've just moved over quickly. And maybe it does sound like a lot, right? Maybe we took a few minutes there to go through those. But think about the size of the Old Testament. And yet we can come up with most of these stories on the spot. But you come to the birth of Christ, to, to what led up to his birth, and angels are everywhere. You come to the beginning of the Gospels, and angels are on every page. They're showing up to everybody who's involved. There are two appearances of angels in the Old Testament that I didn't mention that have a very direct connection to what is happening here. Both of them have to do with the announcement of a child that's going to be conceived and born to those who are not necessarily expecting it. Angels came to Abraham and Sarah to tell them of the coming birth of Isaac, despite their old age. And an angel appeared to the parents of Samson, in Judges 13 to give a similar announcement. So in, in all these stories of you know, angelic messengers, one of the stories that's very common and especially stands out into two very prominent figures in the history of Israel would be these stories of uh, announcing an unforeseen birth. They're known to do this. And any faithful Israelite who knows the scripture, they know the story of their people, they know that this is something that God does. They know that this is something that he has done, at least in part, though it is different. But think how often angels appear here. So that tells us something, right? It, th this child is announced by angels far more than any other. Think about how many songs we sing throughout the year that have to do with angels or speak of angels. There are some, right? There are definitely some. But at Christmas time, how many songs mention the angels? Almost all of them, right? Because they're everywhere here. They, they show up everywhere. That tells us something of the importance of the child that is to be born. So he's announced by angels. He's also given a name. His name will be called Jesus. So it, he's not given a name by his earthly mother or Joseph. Instead, it's given by this angelic messenger. So there's no one on earth that would decide what he would be named. And that's important. Right? To name something or someone is to show something of the authority that one has over another. So for instance... The, some of the first naming that we have in Scripture is Adam naming the animals. Right? He, he names the animals that the Lord brings to him. 
right, to show something of his authority over them. Adam names Eve, the mother of all living. He, he gives her her name. There are various ways that this shows up, but what we have here then is the fact that no one on earth is giving Christ his name. No, Jesus is not named by any man. He's given a name by God himself. It's announced to mankind. It's not given by mankind. And his name, Jesus, means that he is going to save his people. In the Gospel of Matthew, we're told more specifically, it says he shall be named Jesus because he shall save his people from their sins. The name Jesus means the Lord saves. This is what he came to do in order to save, that he might save his people, in order that he might rescue them and deliver them. The name Jesus is also, the, it's the Greek equivalent to the name Joshua. And just think about that. Think about who Joshua was as a, as a figure that Christ would share his name. Moses, the bringer of the law, is able to lead the people of Israel right up to the promised land, but he can't bring them across the Jordan into the rest and peace that they will find in the promised land. He's not the one that brings them across the Jordan and then gives them victory in the land. That's what Joshua does. Joshua leads the people into both victory and rest. And that's exactly what Christ has come to do. It's exactly what he has done. This is what Jesus was born to do, right? Come to save his people, to bring victory, to bring rest. We notice also here that as he is announced, he is said to be the son of David. Right? He said that he will be given the throne of his father, David. And so he is the son of David. He's next in line for the throne. And remember that David was promised by God that, that he would have a son that would always sit on his throne. That the people of God would be ruled forever by someone from David's line. And there were times in the history of Israel after that covenant was made with David that it looked like that was not going to happen. It looked like that was a lost cause, that that was not a promise that God would fulfill, that he would keep. But he did keep it. He did, and this is what Christ has come to do. He is the true son of David, come to sit on the throne. But at the same time, we also see here that he is not just an ordinary heir. He's much more than that, and so he is called the son of the Most High. It says this child will be great. This is what Gabriel says, right? This child will be great, the son of the Most High. We just mentioned this covenant that God made with David. Listen to what it says. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but here's just a portion that I want you to hear. This comes from 2 Samuel. This is the Lord speaking to David, and he said, I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So that's the language of the Davidic covenant. Right? This is the language of God's promise to David. And you see how it's, I mean, it's echoed throughout everything we read from Gabriel, isn't it? Right? It's a lot of that same language. This child is going to be the, the heir, then, of this Davidic covenant. It's, it's obviously echoed here. But it takes on a whole new level at the same time. Because with this announcement, this child is going to be born of a virgin. This child is not just adopted as God's son. He's not, he's not brought into the family of God. He is God's son. 
He is the true Son of God, the only begotten. The child is born of a virgin. It says the Spirit of the Lord would come upon her, the Most High would overshadow her, reminiscent of what we see with the, the glory of God coming upon the tabernacle or the temple. You get this sense that there's a particular holiness. And that's what we're told, right? He will be holy. He is set apart. He is not like others. He's not with a human parentage like every other child born. Rather, he's the true son of God coming and taking on flesh. He is a a new humanity, the beginning of it, the beginning of a new creation that God would begin through him. So he is the true son of God. He's called that twice in this passage. The one title that's given multiple times that he is the son of God, the son of David and the son of God. And lastly, I want us to recognize just how much of what is announced here has these themes of royalty, right? That he is a king. This is not just any child born, but he is a king. All over is this language of royalty, which we've covered already in part. But it's a a royal announcement of the king that is to be born. He will be great and holy. He's announced by angels. He'll sit on the throne. He will rule and reign. He'll have a kingdom that does not end. He will reign forever, it says. So he's not coming as so many earthly kings that come and go. They're given authority for a time and they fall from power or they lose their lives altogether. He's not like that. No, this is an eternal king. This is the rightful ruler of all mankind. He shall have dominion, and all the kings of the earth will come bowing to him one way or the other. And his kingdom, it says, shall have no end. It will continue forever. It will not be overcome. Think about all the ways that human kingdoms fail and fall. Lack of resources, poor management, corruption, death, collapse, a lack of wisdom, a lack of unity. Whatever it might be, right? none of that will destroy his kingdom. None of that can bring an end to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a royal announcement of a coming king. God had been silent for 400 years. Remember Matt, when he was preaching, the last sermon in Malachi talked about this, right? Malachi ends, and there's no prophecy given until we get to the New Testament era. For the people of Israel, especially those who were, were faithfully expecting the Messiah, think about how long that would feel, right? Multiple generations have died not knowing how what God had promised was going to be fulfilled. Not hearing a new word from the Lord. Not, not seeing the work of God in the same miraculous way that they may have anticipated. And then, like light coming through the darkness, there's this announcement. Right? And at first it's small. Right? A dream, an angelic visitation to individuals. But something is clearly happening. Then Zechariah goes into the temple, and he comes out, and he can't speak. He's mute. And so everybody knows something strange is happening. And then Elizabeth does actually conceive in her old age. And that's a story that everybody knows. Right? Everybody knows that this is something that God has done over and over again in the history of his people. He has brought life where it didn't seem possible. He's brought new birth when it was not expected at all. So they know something's happening. They know that story. And then a virgin conceives. That is a new story. That's a new story that they knew was to come. On this night, angels lit up the sky for shepherds outside the city of Bethlehem, which we'll read in a moment, announcing that a child was born. They said, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And the the angelic hosts erupt, right? In the night sky, the the dark night sky, 
and all of a sudden it's just full of angelic voices singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. The stars in the sky announce his birth, bringing magi from the east in order that they might bring him the gifts fit for royalty. So the one of whom the prophets has spoke is here. Prophets like Isaiah that we already read, but hear these words again. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Or hear these words, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is of old from ancient days. This child has come. He is born. Jesus is here. Born a child and yet a king. So congregation of Christ, we live in the time of fulfillment, which means that the, the world has already heard the bursting forth of angelic singers. The darkness has already been pierced by light. But you're here tonight because we get to hear it again. Right? How often in Scripture do we have this sense that we, we need to always be reminded of the things that have happened, of the things that God has done? This no less than any other. Right? To be reminded that this has already taken place, that Christ has already come. Right? This announcement that a king is born, that Christ is born. Now maybe you've never quite heard that before. Or maybe you, you've not had ears to hear it. And I hope, no matter where you are tonight, you can, you can hear it as you should. Right? Hear it and receive it as you should with the anticipation, right? with the excitement, with the fear and the wonder and the awe, with all of it that we should have. Knowing that God has come, God with us. God in the flesh, God made flesh, God incarnate. I hope as you hear the angelic announcement from Scripture, it would be as clear to you as it would be if you were sitting out in the hills outside the city, probably not in this climate, but if you were sitting out alone, right, it's, it's dark, and all of a sudden, right, the sky is full of a bright light with angels singing. Hear that angelic message and know what kind of child this is who has been born. Hear these words again from Gabriel. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Hallelujah. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we do pray that you'd help us to hear your voice from Scripture. That we would hear the announcement of our king once again that we would be filled with the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this for the sake of your never-ending kingdom, for the sake of your glory. Amen.